Let's talk a little about Welsh t-tests and confidence intervals. These are similar in a way to the pooled variance t-procedures, except here we do not pool the variances. So the Welsh procedures are similar to those pooled variance t-procedures, but they do not require the assumption of equal population variances, and then we do not pool the variances together. So the Welsh procedures are approximate. They are not exact procedures. They are approximate procedure, but they work very well in a lot of spots. And the gist of it is we're going to have a different standard error and a different degrees of freedom than the pooled variance t procedures. But overall, the same idea. We may want to do hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. And we have the same goals in mind. So let's take a look at this example that we've looked at before, where we have a random sample of Cairo traffic police officers and a random sample of officers from the suburbs, and the lead concentration in the blood is measured. And it looks like the traffic officers in Cairo have a greater blood lead level than those in the suburbs. So we have a difference here in our samples. It looks like there's a difference, but we might want to ask ourselves a couple of questions about that. We may wish to test if there is a significant difference between those groups, or in other words, is there strong evidence that mu1 is not equal to mu2? Is there strong evidence that the population means differ? And we might want to estimate that difference in the population means with a confidence interval. These are the same points of interest as when we looked at the pooled variance T procedure. We just go about it in a slightly different way. So the Welch T procedure assumptions. We have independent random samples and normally distributed populations. The same assumptions as for the pooled variance T procedure. That normally distributed populations is going to become less important as the sample size increases due to the central limit theorem and all the rest of it. But these first two assumptions are the same as for the pooled variance T procedure. The pooled variance T procedure had the third assumption where the population variances were assumed to be equal. But we do not make that assumption here. So we are going to calculate the standard error of the Welch procedure. And I have a little W here in the subscript representing the fact that this standard error is a little bit different from the pooled variance standard error. And if you look at this, it's a little bit different because we haven't pooled the variances together here. A lot of the times the standard error between the pooled variance procedure and, and Welch's procedure would be fairly similar, not a whole lot of difference, uh, but sometimes they can differ a great deal. So if we want a confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2, we do the same type of thing here. We simply take the best guess of mu1 minus minus mu2, which is the difference in the sample means, we add and subtract our margin of error, which is a t value times the standard error of the Welch procedure. Now one of the tricky bits is that the degrees of freedom for our t are a little bit ugly here. So let's look at that formula. Here's the formula for the approximate degrees of freedom for the t. And it's a bit of a complicated thing, not impossible to calculate it by hand, of course, but overall it is best to use statistical software to calculate this kind of thing. If we wanted to test the null hypothesis that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero, this is a common test that we, we carry out, and this is equivalent to testing whether mu1 is equal to mu2, and we have a very similar test statistic, things we've seen in the past. We take our best guess of mu1 minus mu2, which is x bar 1 minus x bar 2, we subtract off the hypothesized value, which is zero in this case, but we could just forget about that because it's just zero here. And we divide by the standard error. And the degrees of freedom for this T statistic are going to be the degrees of freedom we looked at before. The little bit of an ugly, complicated formula. And if we go back to the example here, we have our difference in sample means between our Cairo traffic officers and those from the suburbs, our standard deviations here between those two groups, and our sample sizes right there. Now these standard deviations for the sample are a little bit different. They're not too, too different. Wouldn't be crazy to use the pooled variance T procedure because those are in the ballpark, but some people may reasonably feel like the Welch procedure would be better to use here. So we could go through and calculate our standard error. So you can pause this and see where all this is coming from but in the bitter end we get a standard error of 1.058 now we can go ahead and calculate our confidence interval and here we have our usual formula for our confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2 we just take the difference in the sample means plus and minus the margin of error which is made up of the t value times the standard error now the t value here is going to be a little bit ugly it's going to be a little bit ugly and our degrees of freedom i'm not going to actually go through and calculate that and show you all the calculations but i'm just going to put down here the end result if you punched it into that ugly formula your degrees of freedom is 115.64 that's your degrees of freedom and then we can go and get the appropriate t and if we if you used a table, we could look up 115 or 116 degrees of freedom, uh, and we would get approximately the correct uh, value. If we use a computer, we can just punch in 115.64. And I'll tell you right now, this, if we were to work this out, this is 29.2 minus 18.2 plus and minus, and I used a computer to get this value of t, 
And I'm going to multiply that by uh, the standard error, which we just found to be 1.058. And so this is 11.0 plus and minus 2.10, which turns out to be 8.90 and 13.10. Now, this was a confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2, which means we can be 95% confident that the difference in these population means lies with in that interval there. We may also want to carry out a hypothesis test. So we could test the null hypothesis here that those two groups have equal population means. And we could test against an alternative hypothesis. Let's use here our default of a two-sided alternative, although opinions could differ depending on the specifics of the problem. And we simply have our t value of uh, the difference in the sample means over the standard error for the Welch procedure of the difference in the sample means. And this, if we put those values in, we had 29.2 for the Cairo traffic officers, 18.2 for those in the suburbs, and our standard error was 1.058. And if we put all of that together, we get 10.40. Now we want our p-value for that, and so we could draw our t-distribution, and the degrees of freedom, using that slightly ugly formula, is 115.64. And our t, our t value here of 10.40 is quite a bit out in this right tail. And because we have this two-sided alternative, our p-value is double the area out to the right because we're looking for the probability of getting a value this extreme or even more extreme. So that is going to be our p-value. So if we threw this into a computer and do all this, we're going to see that the p-value is tiny. So I'm going to say just simply that the p-value is tiny. It's very near zero. Very, 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 very strong evidence against this null hypothesis. Very strong evidence here against that null hypothesis. And so these Cairo traffic officers, which had this sample mean, uh, and the suburb officers at this sample means it looks like there's a real difference there and that these Cairo traffic officers actually have a greater population mean than those from the suburbs. So as I've said before, this is uh, typically best to do in a computer, let the computer do all the calculations for us and let us focus on the proper interpretation of the results. But if we did throw this into a computer, here's the output from the statistical package R, and here is our 95% confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2, similar to what we had, except with more decimal places. And up here is the actual uh, test of the null hypothesis that mu1 is equal to mu2. And a test statistic here, similar to ours, except of a great, greater number of decimal places. Here's the degrees of freedom that the computer does for us nicely. And here's our tiny p-value, less than 2.2 times 10 to the negative 16. Tiny, tiny p-value, very strong evidence against the null hypothesis, very strong evidence that there's a real effect here and that the Cairo traffic officers actually have a greater population mean than those from the suburbs. And the different in the sample means is listed right there and that is a highly significant difference. So for this example, if you look back on what we did for the pooled variance T procedure, these results are very similar here to what we had there. Conclusions are the same, values are a little bit different, but overall very, very, very similar. But the methods can differ a great deal depending on the data. So the very natural question then, which procedure should we use? Should we pool the variances together or should we not pool the variances together? Well, opinions differ on this matter. Sometimes pooling the variances together is clearly a bad idea, but many times it's a bit of a gray area. And we'll look more closely at the choice between the unpooled version and the pooled version in another video.